As you may or may not have heard, Russia has concentrated an unprecedented amount of troops on the Ukrainian border. So let's take a look at what this means, uh, why this is happening, and whether there will be World War III or whether Ukraine will be taken over by Russia itself. Alright, so first off, let's look at how this actually started. Uh, a few weeks ago, the separatists in uh, Ukraine, in eastern Ukraine, in uh, Donetsk and Luhansk, uh, started escalating, which means uh, using prohibited weaponry, uh, shooting at Ukrainian defensive positions uh, from mortars, howitzers, sniper rifles, uh, you know, everything which is prohibited by the Minsk agreements, which basically froze the conflict uh, a few years ago. It was the Minsk agreement that stated that uh, heavy weapons need to be withdrawn from the contact line and that people basically cannot shoot at each other anymore. Uh, this is the agreement that the separatists have been breaking uh, left and right already, but now they actually started to bring out the big guns. So if before it was just sporadic uh, mortar fire or sniper fire, uh, now it's uh, multiple Ukrainian soldiers are dead uh, because they're basically just getting bombarded. So if before there was a one Ukrainian dead soldier for every three, four months, uh, as things escalated, there was a day when there was four dead on the same day. And uh, we had multiple casualties ever since then, uh, of course at the hands of Russian-controlled separatists. Meanwhile, as this is going on, uh, Russia is deploying huge numbers of troops both to the uh, Russian side of the uh, border in the Donbas and to Crimea. The numbers of which are already higher than during the peak of the Ukrainian crisis in 2014, when there was actually active war. And not directly between states, of course, but between uh, Russian-backed separatists and the Ukrainian government. So uh, massive military camps have sprung up around the Ukrainian border, and Russian combat vehicles actually have the same invasion stripes that they had during the 1968 Prague Spring. And these stripes themselves are used to differentiate between uh, enemy and friendly vehicles, of course. Uh, meanwhile, certain Russian officials are openly threatening Ukraine with invasion. Uh, Putin has not threatened U Ukraine yet, uh, at least not openly, but I mean, the, the writing is pretty much on the wall at this point. Uh, the argument right now is the same as ever, uh, that Russia needs to protect uh, Russian citizens abroad. Uh, meanwhile, the reason why there are Russians in Donbass is because Russia gave out a bunch of Russian passports to the local Ukrainians, which is basically giving them citizenship. So I guess that's one way to have uh, Russians abroad that need protecting. But of course the protection of Russian citizens is not the real reason. I mean, you have to be a complete tool to believe that. You know, uh, since when does the Russian government uh, care about its people? They're exporting Sputnik V vaccines all around the world to get uh, geopolitical clout. Meanwhile, they don't have enough to vaccinate the domestic population. So, yeah, uh, that's how much they care about Russian citizens when it's not politically opportune to do so. And uh, Russia and Putin in general is kind of in trouble right now. Uh, the Covid epidemic has hit the Russian economy pretty hard. Meanwhile, we have of course unprecedented corruption in government, uh, you know, uh, obnoxious enrichment for the ruling class and general poverty for the rest of the people, basically. Uh, lower salaries, uh, falling living standards. It's not so nice to live there right now. Uh, and accordingly, Putin's approval ratings are pretty low. It is currently slogging around 65%, uh, which would be pretty high in a democracy, but if you consider that Putin's approval rating after Crimea was taken over was 89%, like that man had a mandate. Uh, this is now pretty much gone, as the uh, military successes after a glow kind of fades and economic problems compound. So basically, right now Putin needs another patriotic war to boost his popularity. And this practice of uh, Russian leaders is older than you think. Uh, for example, Nicholas II, uh, the Tsar before the Bolshevik Revolution, uh, tried to regain his sinking popularity with a quick military success, and so he whipped up the country into a patriotic fervor as he engaged in the Russo-Japanese War. But then Russia lost that war pretty resoundingly, and it was all downhill from there. So now here we are in 2021, and Putin is trying the exact same thing. Or is he? The thing is, uh, the 2021 Ukrainian army is not the same as the 2014 Ukrainian army. Uh, back then, when the crisis started, the Ukrainian army had around, uh, I kid you not, 2,000, 2,500 deployable troops, maybe even less, uh, basically nothing. Currently, they have around 200,000 combat-ready people, uh, with 1 million more in reserve. And uh, on the Global Firepower Index, they are uh, 25th globally, which is pretty impressive, especially that they started from pretty much zero seven years ago. So could they hold the line against the Russian army? Well, not really. I mean, if it's just the two of them going at each other, then eventually the Ukrainians would lose. And of course, nuclear weapons would not be used because, well, deterrence from the US. 
it's your usual Cold War scenario. But here's the thing, the Russian army currently could not achieve a quick victory in Ukraine. And that's the entire point. Even if Russia does uh, overpower Ukraine completely and goes from Donbas to Zakarpatia, that will be pretty much a ferric victory. So, you know, it's nice to win the war against Ukraine, but by the time you actually finish the job, your country is bankrupt, a third of your army is dead, and your economy has collapsed. And that's assuming that no other European power will intervene. Now, of course, if Russia did invade, uh, they would not want the entirety of Ukraine. They don't really care much for the western parts. But what they absolutely want is a land bridge between Russia and Crimea and optionally between Transnistria and Moldova. Uh, Transnistria is this teeny tiny sliver of land which is basically controlled by Russia. So one of their main objectives would be to capture uh, Mariupol, Kherson and Odessa. And with that, they basically have their land bridge. And uh, while they're at it, uh, I would imagine they would go after some uh, industrial centers such as uh, Kharkiv, Poltava, Dnipro, uh, Zaporizhia, Kivrich, uh, Mykolaiv. But then again, with every captured city, the casualties and the costs mount. So realistically, if Russia decided to invade, then it would just be the land bridge, uh, at least between Russia and Crimea. But even this would be rather costly. Even if they manage to overcome the Ukrainian army and no foreign power intervenes, sanctions would be cranked up to maximum. And those of you who are familiar with the situation might ask, well, oh, sanctions, you know, what's the big deal? We've, we've had sanctions for seven years. They, they haven't seemed to work that well. Well, they actually did. You know, sanctions are not designed to, to uh, produce big spectacular results, uh, but rather slow attrition over time, which is actually happening. You know, that's one of the reasons why uh, Russian uh, standards of living are falling, and with it, Putin's approval rating. And we haven't even talked about the real hard-hitting stuff, such as direct sanctions against the country's sovereign debt, which is Biden doing right now, or disconnecting Russia from the SWIFT system, the most important global uh, financial transaction system, which would, of course, be an absolute disaster for Russian business. You know, even if uh, Sergei Lavrov, the foreign minister, says that uh, Russia has to move away from the SWIFT system at some point, that doesn't change the fact that Russian business is pretty embedded in it, and not having it would be very, very bad. So yeah, essentially the Ukrainian crisis right now is a game of costs. You know, who would lose more in what scenario? And right now it seems that Russia would lose the most in case of an open military aggression against Ukraine, such as an invasion, both militarily, financially and diplomatically. And I mean, Russia is a big country, but let's not forget that most of their money comes from selling off the natural resources from under their feet, and that otherwise their economy is the same size that of the Netherlands. You know, Russia has been called a petro-monarchy uh, with nuclear weapons, and for a good reason. Because aside from nukes and oil, and an army kept up by selling that oil, Russia doesn't really have much. I mean, it certainly tries to act like it does, but anyone familiar with the Russian economy knows that this is not the case. You know, we're talking about a country whose export is more than 60% uh, petroleum products. Uh, which is kind of like building your house on quicksand, because oil prices can fluctuate wildly. As the saying in political circles goes, the oil hits $100, Putin invades Ukraine. The oil hits $40, Putin holds a conciliatory speech in the Reichstag. And as of making this video, the price of oil per barrel is $63.03. So is there an actual imminent danger of Russia invading Ukraine? Not right now. If Russia did go ahead with it, the costs would be simply too high. Rather, the staging of Russian troops on the border of Ukraine and Crimea are used as a tool of consolidation for basically all parties. For Putin, he gets to posture as the uh, eastern macho dude uh, with the empire behind him, I guess. You know, protecting all the Russians all around the globe, showing the decadent West what's what, and uh, trying to whip up some kind of patriotic fervor in Russia to uh, help stop his uh, falling approval ratings. Meanwhile, the Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, uses the crisis to accelerate Ukraine's accession into the NATO and potentially to the EU, and uh, rallies the people against the common enemy, thus consolidating his popular support. And, you know, it, it helps a lot that the enemy this time is very much real. And for Biden, this crisis is an excellent tool to solidify US-European relations and to consolidate European powers against Putin. And also to potentially stop Nord Stream 2, this uh, highly debated uh, gas pipeline between Germany and Russia, uh, bypassing Ukraine, which would then reduce Ukraine's uh, relevance and incomes, etc, etc. It's a long story and I'll be making a video about it soon because it's a very interesting one. So this is it, I suppose. Uh, this is all the sides to the crisis on the Ukrainian border right now. 
Things don't point to World War III yet. Just some uh, international feuds, disputes and uh, domestic uh, rallying of support and consolidation of voter blocs. But the crisis did produce a very interesting situation in the Czech Republic, which could almost be called a domestic political crisis, one that involves two ammunition depots of the Czech army and uh, two Russian secret agents. The same ones who actually poisoned Sergei Skripal in the UK with Novichok. So stay tuned because I'll be making a video about that next, and it's really entertaining slash horrifying. In the meantime, if you have any inputs about the Ukrainian crisis, please let me know in the comments, and I'll be seeing you soon. Oh, and like and subscribe, all of that. Thanks for watching.